please take your seats and open your Bibles to Jeremiah and uh, chapter 7. I suppose if Jeremiah's ministry was recorded as a series of music albums, then the last time we were in his prophecy two weeks ago, we were in fact listening to tracks from Jeremiah the early years. But this morning, it's Jeremiah the middle years. I say that because our chapter 7 begins verses 1 and 2. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, if you turn to chapter 26 in your Bibles and uh, verse 1, the beginning of that chapter goes like this. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, 26 verse 1, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the peoples of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. So that occasion in chapter 26 is this occasion in chapter 7. Got it? It's early in the reign of King Jehoiakim. Now his reign, we know from history, began in about 609 B.C., We are therefore about 18 years into Jeremiah's career as a prophet because it began 18 years before when Josiah, Jehoiakim's father, was king of Judah. So it's Jeremiah, the middle years. I I say his career, Jeremiah's ministry is is, is more more like a death sentence. In fact, as you, as you read the account of this occasion there in chapter 26, listen to what happens to Jeremiah as he delivers his message from God. Verse 7 of 26, the priests, the prophets, and the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests The prophets and all the people seized him and said, you must die. Not for the last time does this man find leadership a thankless, dangerous task. Anyone who aspires to leadership in any role in society, but especially Christian leadership, must be prepared for their face to be stuck to a wanted poster around the town. You must die, Jeremiah. So what was it about Jeremiah's sermon here which caused everyone to shout off with his head? Well, look, do some imaginative thinking now. Imagine someone standing in the foyer of Lansdowne Church, Woodbury Avenue. Just as people are arriving for the 9.15 or the 11.15 service. And rather like Private Fraser, the Scottish undertaker come soldier in Dad's army, they loudly shout, doomed, you're all doomed. God has had it with you. To be more accurate historically, we're not in a small church in a provincial backwater, but actually here, we are are in one of the great national buildings of Judah, the Jerusalem Temple. So this is, I don't know, Winchester Cathedral we're talking about, or Westminster Abbey. Even song is about to start. The robed choir is in place, and a lone figure walks to the lectern, grabs the microphone, and says... This ancient space is coming down. And so is the monarchy. And so is the priesthood. And so is the government. It's all over. Just imagine if that happened in Westminster Abbey eh? or St. Paul's Cathedral. 
But that was the heart of Jeremiah's message here in chapter 7. And as uncomfortable as it is, if I am going to be faithful to Scripture at this point this morning, that has to be my message today. So there's not much good news this morning, folks. Like the recent weather, it's pretty bleak. So let's look at it. Firstly, what, what God says to the people. You see, the whole chapter, if you look at the, the chapter as a whole, is organized around conversations, dialogue that God has with Jeremiah, the prophet, about the people, and then with Jeremiah about his response to what he's saying. Let's begin then with what God says through Jeremiah to the people. Look, verse 3 at the text. Look at your Bibles. Verse 3, this is what the Almighty, the God of Israel says, reform your ways and your actions and I will let you live in the land. So the first thing that God says is reform. It's really a call to mind the gap. You know that expression, don't you? If you've been on the London Underground, mind the gap. The gap here between their belief as followers of Jehovah and their behavior. The gap between the 90 minutes or so they spent in the temple in Jerusalem and the rest of the week. Close that space, God says to the people. Reform your ways and your actions. Close that gap. That is always a danger, is it not, for religious, church-going people like us? Is my life consistent or is it compartmentalized? Do I have a split identity? I am religious on a Sunday, but a complete rotter on a Monday through Saturday. Am I living, am I living out in work what I am singing out in worship? You see, something, something like that credibility gap was opening up in this, in this Jewish society. So God says to the people, sort yourselves out. Look, verse 5. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods... The gap widens in verse 9. Read on to verse 9. The gap's widening. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe, safe? To do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. You see how wide the gap is now? Between the, their worship and their work? Between Sunday and the rest of the week? You burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known. Not only, therefore, is their worship empty and bears little relation to their lives, it's false worship. They are bowing down to idols at the same time that they are praising Jehovah. It would be like, it would be like Lansdowne. <laughs> where the worship leader gets us to sing, in Christ alone my hope is found, and then ask us to face east and pray to Mecca. It would be like the preacher after the sermon, bringing out a little Buddha shrine and inviting us to chant. It would be that shocking. But that was religion in Israel at this time. You burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you've not known. And then you come and stand before me in this house which bears my name. And you say, what do they say? We are safe. We are safe. 
one of the great delusions of Western Christianity is that if we attend the chapels and churches and cathedrals of our faith, that we are therefore safe. We are not safe. Religion will not protect you. We are not safe just because we go to church, say our prayers, read our Bibles, belong to a home group. We are not safe. Listen to the delusional self-confidence of these worshipers in verse 4. It is so powerful. Verse 4. Do not trust, says God to the people, in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. Do you get the irony? This is Lansdowne. This is Lansdowne. This is Lansdowne. We are safe. Here you see was a community who thought that they and their temple were invincible. Jerusalem, the city of God, the temple, the house of God, they had guaranteed securities. Hadn't Jehovah promised that? To defend the walls of this city, to bless the inhabitants of this holy hill? History was on their side, they believed. But God saw it differently because their worship had become one gigantic cover-up for their hypocrisy. You rock up to the temple, but your relationships are in a mess. You sing these great worship songs, but you treat your employees with contempt. You oppress the vulnerable, you marginalize the marginalized, and you think that you're right with me? You think you're safe? In the temple? Think again. The temple was no longer a safe space. It was no longer a sacred place. The Lord had left the temple. It's been taken over, he says, by charlatans. It's become a den of robbers. So what's needed? Reform. Amend your ways. Reform. Why? Because liturgy is not going to save us. Nor all our traditions and hymns, whether ancient or modern, whether Charles Wesley or Matt Redman, they will not save us. For worship without personal integrity, worship without social justice is delusional. What does the New Testament say? Faith without works is dead. Reform then. And secondly, remember. That was the second major thing that God said to the people through Jeremiah the prophet. You can read it for yourself in verse 12 of your Bibles. Verse 12. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to that because of the wickedness of my people Israel. If you think, Judah, that history is on your side, that Jerusalem and its temple will never be shaken, you are reading the past selectively. What's the backstory to this? Well, you see, Shiloh was in the north of the country, and Shiloh had been the place where long before Jerusalem was the capital and the temple were built, there in Shiloh, the tribes of Israel would would come together for their national worship celebrations and, and festivals. It was like Spring Harvest or Keswick or New Wine or Soul Survivor or Word Alive. They all happened at Shiloh. That was the great gathering of God's people for the Ark of the Covenant was there in Shiloh. But in a battle, the Philistine enemies captured 
the Ark of the Covenant. And while it was eventually regained, the Ark never returned to Shiloh. And eventually, the city itself was completely destroyed. So God is saying to the people through Jeremiah, remember what happened to Shiloh. Look at it now. Because that's going to be the future for Jerusalem. Now, for a Jew to imagine that their glorious temple could ever suffer the same fate was to think the unthinkable. It can't happen here, can it? It can't happen here in Jerusalem, in our great temple. But God says to the people in verse 14, it will happen here. Look, verse 14, therefore what I did to Shiloh I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your fathers. I will thrust you from my presence, just as I did all your brothers, the people of Ephraim. I I learned my trade as a young, inexperienced preacher by preaching to to congregations of, of 20 people on most Sundays. That was all. If you saw 30 gathered for worship in the back hall, you thought the revival had broken out. And if you had an organist present, you thought you'd died and gone to heaven. Often I would not just preach, but I'd leave the service, I'd take the offering, I'd even give the notices. The only thing I didn't have to do was the children's talk because there was rarely anyone under 60 in the congregation. Folks, that's where I learned the ropes of preaching. Inwardly, I I smile whenever I meet graduates today, fresh out of Bible college, who give the impression that such is their preaching gift that they should be preaching to hundreds already. So for two years, I would travel up and down the mining valleys of South Wales to the chapels of Zoa and Bethesda and Carmel and Ebenezer, and Zion, and Pisgah, Pisgah. Such was the power of religion once upon a time in Wales that they would build not just five chapels in one town, but five chapels on one street. There were, in many cases, these buildings and churches born in revival. They were the products of proud nonconformity. And if you had told the deacons of Carmel back in those days that within two generations their full pews would be empty, they would have said to you, it can't happen here. If you had told the elders of Bethesda dressed in their Sunday best, that within 50 years, the chapel that they led would be sold to retailers as a carpet factory or turned into a mosque, they would have looked at you in astonishment and said, impossible, that can't happen here. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. That will never happen here. But it did. I saw with my own eyes what happens to churches where worship becomes empty and idolatrous, where ritual is God, where traditionalism drives the program of the church rather than the gospel, where formalism drowns the church in a sea of committees and bureaucracies and processes. For in a church where religion is king and not God, eventually there will be a stench of death. So I say, Lansdowne, don't say it can't happen here. I say, 
Lansdowne, don't say it can't happen here. No church has a divine right to be healthy and to grow. If our worship is divorced from our work, we will die. If our agenda is driven by our comfort rather than our mission, we will die. If we think that the completion of a building project secures our future, we will die. Reform and remember. Perhaps, though, there is a wider application still here. For the prophet's job in Israel was to address a far wider audience than simply the worshippers at the temple. Jeremiah and his ilk, like Ezekiel and, and Daniel and Hosea, all the other prophets, they spoke from God, from God to the great institutions of the day, to the priesthood and to the monarchy and to government. And, and we, the church today, has a similarly prophetic role. We are called to speak truth to power. What, therefore, might we say in the light of Jeremiah's text? Perhaps something like this. Sovereign Queen, Parliament of Westminster, do not say we are safe, that we are masters of our political fate do not say that our democracy is secure, that our economy will not crash. If there is no justice in the land, if the fatherless and the widows are not cared for, if the refugee is oppressed, then we stand vulnerable to the judgment of God. Reform and remember that was what God said to the people all those years ago, and I think it's what God says to us today. Do not say, Lansdowne, that we are safe, that it cannot happen here. If our worship is divorced from our lives, if our songs are merely a cover-up for hypocrisy, and if you think that was shocking, then listen, secondly, to what God says to the prophet. If you think that what God says to the people is bad enough, then listen to this from verse 16, what God says to the prophet. Verse 16, Jeremiah, do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, eh? Incredible. Don't bother praying, is what God says to Jeremiah. Don't bother praying. I told you it was shocking. Now, there's a question for us to wrestle with, I think, as we go on. Is it ever right to stop praying about something? Are there some situations in our lives, some issues, for which it is no longer appropriate to bring them to God in prayer? Is it ever legitimate just to shut down in prayer about something and move on? Apparently so, in, in this case. Apparently so. Do not pray for this people, Jeremiah. So disturbing was, was, was that advice in the prophet's ears that God has to repeat that exact instruction to Jeremiah three more times in the rest of the prophecy. Do not pray for Judah anymore, Jeremiah. 11.14, 14.11, 15.1, and there are other occasions too. So why was the prophet advised to stop praying? Because God had stopped listening. That's why. Do not plead with me for them, 
for I will not listen. These people were so far gone spiritually, so dead to God, that they were past praying for. So Jeremiah says the Lord, don't waste any more of your time on these people in prayer for them. It's over. I'm done with it. Now why does God say that? Why does God say to Jeremiah, give up because I'm not listening? Because God's people have stopped listening to him. That's why. And I think there is a warning here for all of us. Those who will not listen to God will in the end not be heard by God either. And that suggests a second thing which God says to the prophet. It's equally challenging. Don't bother praying. Secondly, my patience has run out. I think that is the unavoidable conclusion of this passage. It is possible, my friends, to provoke God once too often, to step across a line once too often, and that's it. And from verse 17, God explains to the prophet why it was now too late. Listen to verse 17. Do you not see what they are doing in the towns of Judah, Jeremiah, and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, and the women knead the dough and make cakes of bread for the queen of heaven. That was Baal's consort, the female goddess Ashtarah. They pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. But am I the one they are provoking, declares the Lord? Are they not rather harming themselves to their own shame? That is a pretty damning description of of life in Israel, isn't it? The worship of other gods has, has become normalized. There is nothing that the Berkowitzes and the Leibovitzes and the Weinstein families enjoyed more than baking cakes as a family in the shape of a goddess. The kids, the fathers, the mothers were were all involved in this kind of little cottage industry at home, in the kitchen, baking their godlets. But not only was this way of life provoking and hurting God, it was was damaging them are they not rather harming themselves declares the Lord no I don't imagine that after this morning members of Lansdowne Church will go home and bake goddess cakes but you know like I do that we each can have our 21st century idol equivalents I know my own heart I'm sure you know yours it's an idol making factory is my heart and yours. We churn them out. We invest in them. The idol of, I don't know, education. The idol of peer approval. The idol of image and, and health. But here's the lesson. Investing in idols can seriously damage your spiritual health. Not just personally, but nationally. You see verse 20? Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place on man and beast, on the trees of the field, and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. The destructive effects of their idolatry are going to be felt at every level of their society. For when a society's gods fall, the foundations give way. The institutions of state crumble. The markets crash and burn and it's the poorest the vulnerable who will suffer most as if to make the point that it's too late to pray and that they run the clock down on God's patience Jeremiah is told a third thing by the Lord it's most peculiar in verse in verse 20 26 no no Verse 29. Look at it in your Bibles. It is bizarre. 29. Cut off your hair 
and throw it away. Take up a lament on the barren heights for the Lord has rejected and abandoned this generation that is under his wrath. We didn't read it earlier in the passage, but we, we need to keep in mind the flow here. And in verse, verse 29, the third thing that God says to Jeremiah is get a haircut. God asks this man to do some very strange things in the course of his ministry. Next week, Jeremiah will be told to go and buy a, a, a linen belt and wrap that belt around his waist. Well, this week, it's a trip to the barbers. Why? Well, a completely bald prophet walking around Jerusalem sometime in 609 BC was a dramatic enactment of the state of the relationship between Yahweh, the Lord, and his people. It's off. Like, like Jeremiah's hair, there's nothing left of it. There is no relationship. So both Jeremiah's temple sermon and his haircut are warning signposts to the future. God has had it with these people. Now, Jeremiah saying that was not only treasonable, which is why the authorities want to execute him, but a bald prophet preaching gloom and doom would also have been laughable. Remember, these people believed that they and their temple were safe, that this was project fear, that Jeremiah was wrong. But 20 years later, as Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army marched into Judah, deported the people, destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem, the unthinkable happened. And Jeremiah describes that future in the most graphic and appalling way from verse 32 of chapter 7. So beware the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call it Topheth or the valley of ben Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Then the carcasses of this people will become food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And there will be no one to frighten them away. I will bring an end to the sounds of joy and gladness, to the voice of bride and bridegroom in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. For the land will become desolate. That is an Armageddon description of a dystopian future, of apocalyptic judgment. The entire social fabric of Judah will collapse. Public services will no longer be able to cope. Normal life will not be possible. I told you it was pretty depressing, didn't I? I told you this was a tough message. I did warn you at the outset that this wasn't going to be one of my nice, fluffy, cuddly messages. But what I do want to do now is end with a message of hope. And that is quite right and proper for several reasons. Firstly, because the original readers of this dark prophecy were the survivors of that judgment. Uh, Jeremiah was speaking and writing to a remnant of people who were left. The people who represented hope for the future. You see, that, that's why as we make our way through this, this prophecy of 52 chapters, just occasionally the light will appear through the cracks. That's why I find our, 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 our graphic for this sermon so beautifully helpful. It illustrates the truth. Grace in the end. The little green shoots of hope even here begin to emerge from dry, dark ground. So let, let's reflect as we finish on what God says to the exiles. Learn from the past. 
You, you can well imagine what those in the concentration camps of Babylon thought as they read this message. Huh, he was right all along. Jeremiah was right. We should have listened to him back then in Jerusalem. Let's not make the same mistake and repeat history. We refused to listen to his preaching when we were there back home in the city of God, so let's listen to God through him now. Let's reform our ways. I wonder, too, if this word from the Lord helped them in another way. Don't you think that they would have wrestled with the question as they sat in captivity by the rivers of Babylon and wept? Don't you think they were asking, why has this all happened to us? Well, the explanation is, is, is given in, in verse 25 of our chapter. From the time your forefathers left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you, my servants, the prophets, but, but they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their forefathers. <laughs> For centuries, Israel had displayed this tendency to ignore God. And, and the present generation had done the same. And so those were the consequences. Exile, captivity. Their ancestors had missed the whole point of faith. What's that point? Well, obedience is the point of faith, as Jeremiah is told in verse 22. For when I brought your forefathers out of Egypt and spoke to them, I didn't just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but I gave them this command. Obey me and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Walk in all the ways I command you that it may go well with you. Obedience is the key to blessing. Those who want to live in God's land must follow God's ways. But they hadn't done that. They'd messed around with God. They hadn't taken him seriously enough. And their religion had become a cover-up. And it couldn't save them. So that's why they were in the mess they were in. But there was something else positive. If Yahweh could still get through to them and communicate with them in Babylon by this prophecy from Jeremiah, that meant that their relationship with him was still alive. It also meant that their God was not tied to one place, to Shiloh or Jerusalem. That they could know God in exile, that their faith could survive without a temple. For Jehovah was the God whom the whole earth could not contain. And he also had plans for his people even in the most desperate circumstances. Isn't that what our motto text at the beginning of the year taught us? Exile is a place where we can know and serve God. So let's make the most of it. We may lose everything like this generation did. We may be uprooted from all that is familiar to us, disconnected from the traditions of our religion, but God lives. And that means our faith can live too. And there is more. While not directly the message of this chapter, the message of the whole book of Jeremiah does contain those little shoots of hope. Jeremiah tells the exiles, there will be life beyond Babylon, beyond exile. Judgment is not going to have the last word. There is to be a future for the people of God. There will be a homecoming. There is the hope of a new temple, he will tell them. A rebuilt city, a fresh start, what Jeremiah and the other prophets will call the new covenant. So not only does God tell the exiles, learn from the past, he says, look to the future. The best is yet to be. For if we widen the lens of Jeremiah and take the message of the whole Bible, what do we see? that this new covenant comes into being when God himself moves into our world. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. The word dwell literally means tabernacles or temples among us. God reveals his nature in the divine human Jesus of Nazareth. And in the temple of his human body, Jesus lives and dies 
He takes that temple of his body to the cross. He seals the new covenant deal with his blood. No more sacrifices now. No more temple worship required. We can meet and know God in and through Jesus and through his spirit. Christ lives in us so that we become the temples of the living God. For the church, as you know, my friends, the church is not a building to which we go, but a people to whom we belong. All this, of course, is way beyond Jeremiah's vision and timeline, but it's part of ours. We, we, you and I, we are the people in whom God lives by his spirit. Therefore, we are to be holy. Our worship and our work must be aligned. There can be no separation between Sundays and Mondays. We are to mind that gap. We are to reform our ways. We are to remember the past. And never imagine that it can't happen here. For obedience is the result and the consequence of blessing. And as we obey, we look to the future, the ultimate future, when beyond all our worship services, beyond all our plans and building projects, there is this final slide on the screen. There is this John's vision of the future. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's temple, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And John says, I did not see a temple in the city, Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. It's good to end in heaven, isn't it? And that is the direction of travel for all those in exile who are trusting in God. And that destination of ours is not to a disembodied existence, but to the new heavens and the new earth, a new creation, a holy city, God with us. He will be the temple of his people. The Lamb, Jesus, will be our light. Amen. Amen. Let's have the band up and wrap up this morning with a, with a song that is both serious in its content but ultimately hopeful in its message. Great is the darkness that covers the earth. Oppression, injustice, and pain. What's our hope? What's the hope of the world? What's the hope of the church? What's the hope of the nation? Come, Lord Jesus. Pour out your spirit, we pray. Pour out your spirit on us, your temple today.